Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Karen Marotz. I'm the head of Bellsburg Library here at the Vancouver campus. And on behalf of the SFU Library, I'm very pleased to welcome you to the SFU Vancouver campus and to this event. SFU acknowledges the Coast Salish people on whose traditional territories we are privileged to live, work, and play. Our event this evening, The Failure of Access, Rethinking Open Education, has been organized for Open Education Week, a celebration of the global open education movement. The goal of Open Education Week is to raise awareness about the movement and its impact on teaching and learning worldwide, and I'm sure our distinguished speaker and panelists will succeed in this objective. As a collaboration between SFU, UBC, BC Campus, BC Research Libraries Group, and the Public Knowledge Project, this event will explore the goals, failures, and successes of open education. On behalf of the organizers, I hope you enjoy the stimulating discussion. And in case you want to live tweet the event, the hashtag is posted on the slide up above. It's hashtag OpenEducationWK. And uh, on the back of your name tags, you'll find the uh, wireless password for uh, wireless access. I now have the pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker for this evening, Dr. Ishan Abewardena, Advisor, Open Education Resources at the Commonwealth of Learning. Dr. Abewardena joined the Commonwealth of Learning on January 1st, 2016 as Advisor, Open Education Resources. He comes to the Commonwealth of Learning from the Open University of Sri Lanka, where he was Director of International Academic Relations and Acting Director, National Online Distance Education Service. Prior to that, Dr. Abewardena served as a Senior Lecturer in Information Technology at Wawasan Open University, Penang, Malaysia from 2009 to 2013, and was Deputy Director at the School of Science and Technology Wawasan Open University from 2013 to 2014. In addition to his academic experience, Dr. Abewardena has held several key technical positions in the UK information technology industry. He holds a PhD in computer science from the University of Malaya, Malaysia, master's degrees in engineering management and wireless enterprise business systems from Brunel University, UK, and a BSc in Computer Science from Bangalore University, India. He's also a member of several professional bodies within the technology industry. A computer scientist by training, Dr. Abewardena's research interests include educational technology, open educational resources, e-learning, MOOCs, open and distance learning, and mobile application development. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ishan Abiwardena. Hi, good evening. Um, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. It's my first time here at the SFU Vancouver campus. Uh, we are at Burnaby, so we don't come down this, this way <laughs> quite often. The train goes the other way. Um, so my job today is to set the stage for the interesting panel, which is going to happen uh, for around one hour, at, uh, starting at 7.30, I think. Um, what I'm going to do is to you know, give you an overview of what's happening at the moment uh, in terms of uh, OER, open education, and MOOCs, and what we see in the field um, and when we go and speak to governments and institutions. So just to start off, uh, <clears throat> I thought uh, I'd give a brief recap of what uh, open education is to you know, uh, all of us who have forgotten. Uh, just a refresher. Um, yes, I mean, um, the philosophy of open is embedded in uh, all open things we do. And uh, open education has taken you know, several roles in the, in the uh, present, and it will take on more roles in the future. I mean, OERs are you know, quite key, and now we are getting into uh, massive open online courses as well. Um, MOOCs are not necessarily OER, but uh, we do talk about those uh, in detail. I'm sure the panelists will take that up later on as well. 
So um, when education combined with uh, openness, we have education without barriers. There are plenty of uh, open universities around the world who are trying to reach the uh, last rung of the academic ladder. Uh, that's, that's their mission, that's what they're trying to do. Giving people a second opportunity, a second chance at education. Um, people who haven't gotten the opportunity reaching the marginalized, um, especially in the Commonwealth, our own jurisdiction, uh, we, uh, we concentrate on the marginalized folks as well as um, women um, who have been uh, excluded from higher education. Looking at uh, openness in practice, um, you know, this is how the open education movement kind of works and moving towards. Um, usually, um, you know, you have the open entry system, and uh, now we actually have the modalities of collecting credits and going around to different universities and trying to get a um, qualification in that way. I'm sure all of you have, or most of you have heard of the uh, OERU uh, concept, uh, which is taking place at the moment, where, you know, people study through uh, open educational resources supported by tutors, collect credits from various universities, go and um, get a credible uh, qualification at the end. But, you know, there has to be some sort of buy-in by the institutions, like for example, I don't know whether um, the credits from the Open University of Sri Lanka would be valid uh, at Athabasca University. So that kind of understanding is not there still, but um, in an ideal world, uh, open education should be open without, bro without borders. Um, so that, you know, uh, the global north and the south can mingle. Looking at uh, openness, it's a evolving uh, concept. Uh, we've all seen uh, open access, open entry, then going, moving into uh, open education resources, and then um, the latest uh, phenomenon uh, is uh, MOOCs. We don't know what the future holds, um, technology is getting cheaper and cheaper. We are moving. Uh, most countries have skipped uh, e-learning and gone straight into m-learning. Um, and uh, virtual reality is uh, coming up in a big way. Uh, um, virtual reality is becoming very cheap. So um, you know we we don't know what what the future holds. But at the moment, OERs and MOOCs are you know uh, dominating the landscape. Oops. Okay, let's look at the, uh, the demand. Uh, the latest um, declaration or the latest stance that we have taken um, as a people is to uh, go with the uh, sustainable development goals. And um, SDG4 is what is directly applicable in this uh, particular scenario. So education 2020, uh, 2030, um, you know, there are quite a number of action, action points that we need to address. Um, and uh, open education addresses quite a number of them. Um, ensuring inclusive and equitable access, equitable quality education, and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. I think that kind of encapsulate what open education is trying to do. Looking at the demand, uh, by 2025, uh, we need about, uh, there will be about 263 million uh, tertiary education, uh, tertiary students. So uh, at the moment, in 2012, we had around 165 million. Um, so it, it seems that the current uh, education, brick and mortar education system, or even the current uh, open education system is uh, not very apt at, uh, at delivering education to the masses. I mean, this is where the MOOC phenomenon, uh, you know, came in and gave some promise. Um, towards educating the masses, but there are issues, as we know, which were highlighted in, in the abstract as well for this particular uh, event. So I'm sure that will come up later on. Looking at the uh, open universities, here I have some of the uh, mega universities, uh, more than 100,000 students. I got these details from uh, Wikipedia on the 25th of March. I summed it up myself, and it came to around uh, 10.5 million learners. Uh, but the need, uh, when it comes to 2025, 20, will be 263 million. So that's quite a huge gap. Um, maybe uh, OERs and MOOCs could help, uh, but that might be a uh, 
that might still be in the making, as we will see in the next few slides. Obviously, um, OERs are big in the open education movement. Uh, many institutions and governments are going gun ho into this. Uh, but you know, having working in the field, we do come across problems as, as well, which I will highlight later on. When it comes to OER, I have to uh, mention the Paris OER Declaration, which is kind of the uh, uh, pivotal point of OER where we took stock in 2012 of what has happened since uh, 2002 and what's going to happen in the next few years. Um, so it, it, it gave some good recommendations, around 10 uh, recommendations for governments. It was a non-binding <coughs> declaration. Um, however, governments did take to heart the use or usefulness of uh, open educational resources. What we did at the Commonwealth of Learning last year was to um, have a look at the um, OER movement since 2012. Um, and uh, to see where we are at uh, with respect to implementing those recommendations in 2012. So we took uh, four action points or recommendations and we went to all of our partner institutions in the Commonwealth to see uh, what has happened. Uh, we went to around uh, 214 institutions, if I'm not mistaken, and got around 1,000 odd responses, but uh, around 650 complete responses from our own partner institutions. And uh, we tried to answer six questions um, regarding the um, implementation of the Paris recommendations. So training, uh, perceptions, uh, quality assurance, uh, opportunities and challenges, and technology and tools used for OER. So these are basically what we try to um, uh, explore, um, particularly for the reason that our interventions as an intergovernmental organization, when we go into governments, when we go in, into open institutions and tell them what to do or help them uh, to achieve certain goals, we need to know what they're lacking or what, we, what they're having. So um, we pride ourselves as the Commonwealth of Learning uh, in being in the forefront of uh, OERs, uh, within, at least within the Commonwealth. And now, you know, um, we are uh, expanding into the non-Commonwealth as well. Um, however, we needed to know, we needed to take stock and uh, get a baseline of where we are at. So these are the uh, results uh, we obtained. So the six questions, and uh, yes, it's, it's very good. Um, uh, we see the, we see the, uh, uh, benefits of OER, but there are certain barriers um, to uh, implementing OER in these institutions. So what they mentioned was that they needed more training, teachers needed more training in OER. We've been providing training, um, and one of the key points was that uh, the training workshops are too short, they're too theoretical. Um, we need hands-on training. Um, yes, we like the concept of OER, uh, but uh, we don't know how to do it. So you know that was a key point. Uh, more credibility. Still, there is a there, there's there's a, there's still a credibility issue with open universities. I mean, a certain prejudice, um, and OER suffer from the same thing. Um, even even among open educators, you know, some of them, you know, kind of uh, question the credibility of uh, OER, um, which is correct in a way, although. We say ideally OERs are of a better quality uh, because they are peer reviewed. Realistically, how many OERs are peer reviewed? Realistically, so um, so that's that's one question, and it's a it's a fair question. So we need to make sure that there is cert, there is a certain amount of quality assurance which is put into open educational resources before we put them online. Um, and teachers need to be strongly encouraged to share their work openly. Yes, they like taking things from outside, but they don't like to put it back. Um, <laughs> academics, right? I'm an academic too, so uh, you know that's that's what we do. Um, so um, yeah, trying to convince them that uh, your lecture notes are not better than whatever's out there is still a very <laughs> very difficult task. I mean, <laughs> That's the first question I ask whenever I am doing a workshop on open educational resources. Do you think that your lecture notes are better than everything out there? So 
Some say yes. Um, some scratch their head. Um, but, you know, eventually they will come around, and hopefully they will come around. Um, then they say allocate more time and resources towards uh, OER. They say we have enough work. You know, we, um, whenever we are not teaching, we are, you know, marking scripts. Uh, we are tutoring students. Uh, we are helping students. We are writing papers. We are doing research. And whenever we are not doing any of that, we are on Facebook. So, uh, <laughs> so yes, uh, they say always allocate um, more time and resources. And please acknowledge us for this. Um, and, uh, you know, if I am taking the initiative to uh, create OERs and release them openly, then, uh, you know, make sure I get some sort of acknowledgement for that. Um, that's, that's one of the points that they have raised. And uh, make OER easier to find and download. Yes, there are a number of repositories out there, but we only know um, of a few. Um, you know, I quite frequent OER comments. Uh, I go to Flickr CC. Um, I, I go to Wikimedia Commons. I, I don't go anywhere else, really. So, so, but there are plenty of other repositories with really, really good materials. So it's important that we kind of publicize or make aware uh, where these repositories are, how to download materials from these repositories. And also, it's important to educate them or train them on how to uh, reuse and remix uh, these open educational resources, especially you know when it comes to multimedia, audio, video, um, many of us don't have the skills to revise and remix them, including myself. This is when we drafted the uh, Kuala Lumpur Declaration, uh, where we took all of these points into consideration. So uh, the idea is to develop strategies and policies at government and institutional level. And the Commonwealth of Learning is um, um, quite engaged in that aspect. Uh, we work with uh, quite a number of governments um, as well as institutions to create um, national OER policies as well as provincial and institutional um, OER policies. But creating policies is one thing. Um, you know, usually when you create a policy, it gets implemented or it gets stuck in someone's um, closet or filing cabinet for quite some time. Um, there is one example of a policy which sat in someone's office for 18 years. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes that happens. Um, that's policy. So, you know, we can push them only up to a certain point, And after that, you know, politics take over. Um, so policies are like that. You know, it's hit and miss. You work with a government for three years, five years, and the policy is developed, and then it goes into uh, a, uh, a uh, national repository, um, which, uh, which they archive it. Um, I've done uh, two uh, institutional OER policies. I've implemented two institutional OER policies, and uh, the, the implementation process um, took at least one year in each case. Uh, because there was, even though these are open universities and even though they're very much into open educational resources, when there's a policy, uh, they're a bit reluctant. You know why? One thing is, some of us do copy stuff from the internet. Um, so we don't want things to go out onto the internet uh, for obvious reasons. And the other thing is, we don't really want to give, us, give our stuff uh, free of charge. So. But this is the uh, process we follow uh, when it comes to implementing open educational resources in um, institutions. So four stages, uh, building capacity, helping them to set up the institutional repository, um, helping them to go through the quality assurance processes uh, for their materials, and um, you know, kind of guiding them towards rewards and recognition. How do you integrate rewards and recognition in the long run to make the whole OER process uh, sustainable? Um, otherwise, it's a one-off intervention. You do a pilot project, and they, you're back to square one after a few years. So it has to be institutionalized, and the buy-in has to be there from the faculty as well as the, um, the administration of the institution. So uh, then I thought I'd add something from the Cape Town Declaration. Open education is not limited to just to open educational resources. So uh, we need to look at other things as well. So I thought 
I'd speak a little bit about MOOC. Um, I know there will be a debate later on, but uh, from our experience at the Common Health of Learning, um, I thought I'd give a, a brief um, introduction to MOOC. So um, yes, you know, this is um, pretty much, you know, all of you know what's been happening with respect to MOOCs and what's going to happen. Well, I mean, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know whether it's going to fade away, uh, replaced by something else. Uh, we don't know whether MOOCs will be uh, the, next big, the next big thing. Um, it's not yet. Uh, we don't know whether uh, the ch changes in technology will radically revolutionize uh, uh, MOOCs. We don't know yet, but it's, it's going somewhere. Maybe some people would say the, the, uh, the MOOC fever um, is settling a little bit in the um, global north. Uh, where you know people are moving towards other technologies and other pedagogies and things like that. However, the global south, the developing nations, the Commonwealth, they're trying to play catch up. Why? Because they do realize that uh, MOOCs are a credible way of bridging that gap between 10.5 million and 263 million students. So um, the only problem with the global south is that um, most of the time, or up until recently, they took the exact same model which was used in developed countries and tried to implement that in the developing countries. Now, the, the, the MOOCs, uh, which were run by um, you know, Coursera or MIT, edX, you know, are, are geared to a situation where technology, bandwidth, infrastructure, money is not a very big issue. Um, the, the motives behind those MOOCs were different. You know, educating or reaching out um, to the world and you know, trying to you know, educate or impart education um, to the global masses, philanthropic. But uh, when it comes to the global south, it's different. It's a necessity, it's a need. So we need to look at MOOCs in a, in a different light. Uh, it has to work in the global south. Also, um, you know, you have to have a credible qualification at the end. Uh, if, when it comes to the developing world, you don't have time to leisurely take a MOOC uh, just for the fun of it. You, if you are spending two hours of your time where you can go and work somewhere and earn money for your family, you need to have a credible qualification at the end of it. So credentialing MOOCs, a recognition of uh, MOOC qualifications, those are at a national level. Like for example, I'll take the example of India. They have, put, uh, they have come up with the SWAM platform. Um, yesterday I got an email saying that they have 43 MOOCs on it now. But what they have done is they have gone through the process nationally. They, they went through it nationally. They made sure the universities have units and the universities recognized MOOCs which are offered by other universities and those credits were transferable. So they're getting there. They're not there yet, uh, but they're getting there. And that's the kind of, those are the kind of issues the Global South is uh, looking at at the moment. These are some, some figures I, I got off, a, off of one of the reports and uh, you know, close to 7,000 MOOCs from um, 700 universities uh, being offered. Now, I'll give you another example. Um, there was once a MOOC, I will not name the institution, uh, which was offered and only 30 people registered. Out of that, only three people completed it. So, but it was called a MOOC. So you have to, you have to kind of take it with a pinch of salt um, and, and also see how, how would you define uh, the term massive? You know, are you going to use the Dunbar number? Uh, or, you know, is 5,000 massive for you? Is 50,000 massive for you? So it all depends on how you define it, okay? There's no argument that online learning is, um, is going to be a key factor. Now, this is one statistic which I found and uh, quite a number of students are taking online learning and governments are taking that um, quite seriously as well. But let's look at what's holding us back uh, with respect to implementing MOOCs and open educational resources. 
So this, we, we all know, you know, the MOOC takers are, you know, serial MOOC takers. You know, most of these people are quite educated and they have, uh, you know, spare time and they like to learn more. And, uh, you know, so they go through MOOCs. Yes, you know, agreed. I've gone through a couple of MOOCs myself, just for the fun of it. But that's, if you, if you, look, at the, if you look at the Global South um, and if you contextualize MOOCs to the developing world, um, that's, that wouldn't be their priority. They should be catering to the skills market. They should be catering to the marginalized communities. But you know, there are issues with respect to that. And one is the cost of developing MOOCs. It might not be a big issue, like for example, $38,000 might not be a big issue uh, in the developed world, or $74 per learner might not be a big, I mean, it's not a big number, but if you, if you consider a country like uh, India, that's, that's around 4,000 rupees. If you consider a country like uh, Sri Lanka, that's like 10,000 rupees. And the average um, salary of a Sri Lankan is 20,000 rupees. So that's half their salary, you know, monthly salary. So, uh, you know, when it comes to countries like this, content development, running these MOOCs, sustainability, technology, all of these aspects come into play. Excuse me. Now, this is um, one case study from Sri Lanka. Uh, I'm working currently in um, Sri Lanka, Botswana, and Cameroon in the general education system, and we are implementing uh, provincial OER policies. Um, for these provinces, so 10 in Botswana, 10 in Cameroon, and nine in Sri Lanka. Uh, we have already developed the uh, provincial policies for Cameroon and Botswana and Sri Lanka as well. Sri Lanka, we just had a big national workshop uh, on uh, the provincial policy implementation where we you know, pushed it that much further so that now it's with the provincial governments to implement. Why we took this model is to go from the bottom up rather than going top down. Uh, it brings more results for us because if I went to the Sri Lankan government and started negotiating with the Ministry of Education, it would have taken me three years before they even you know, sat down to uh, draft a policy on OER. However, it was much easier to go to the ministry, get their consent, and then go to the provincial ministries, which had uh, a bit more autonomy, and go and sensitize them on OER, advocate OER, show them the uh, use for OER, which they really understood and appreciated, and then make them uh, do the policies which will allow them to use OER at a provincial level, even though there is no policy above, and also kind of encourage the, or force the ministries to create a national policy to govern all of these uh, provincial policies. So um, that's one approach we took. But um, having said that, when I went to the Sri Lankan government, um, this is what they said. We produce, and I studied uh, in school in Sri Lanka, so I, I know this for a fact. 30 million copies uh, of textbooks at a cost of uh, 3,000 million given to all the students, right? So textbooks in Sri Lanka, Cameroon, and Botswana, um, Cameroon at least, are, are free, okay? Um, it comes to us free. It comes to the teachers for free. Uh, it's printed. You can take it home. Um, after uh, you finish the academic year, you return it. Sometimes it's recycled. Sometimes you get new books. The next generation gets new books. So. Then the, the, the ministry asked me, so why do we need OER, right? I mean, okay, I, I was stuck now. I had my speech ready, you know. <laughs> the OERs can give you this, this, this. So I said OERs give you more interactivity. You can do flip classrooms, multimedia, video, all of that, right? So, uh, so then they said, um, you know, the books are free, the, the, tax, the tax money is hidden, uh, the books are free, the government owns the copyright, okay, so we don't pay royalty, and the bulk of the cost for our textbooks is printing and distribution. How can OER help? I was stuck. 
then I had to say, no, 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 this can be delivered online, it's open, you know, you have, uh, uh, you know, a lot of interactivity, you know, we brought in the videos and, you know, flipped classrooms and all of that. Then the question was, yes, but you being a Sri Lankan, you should know the internet penetration in the country, right? Most of our students don't have internet at home. Uh, our schools don't have the facilities. We don't have computers. Um, they're getting there, but they're starting. But you know, there are four million students. You know, none of. I mean, we can't give away four million tablets for free at this point. So how do you propose we do this? That's a question. That's a very good question. Now I'm still struggling. Although we have done the policies for these countries, I'm still struggling to justify the policy or how to implement this policy in these countries. The the other thing is, okay, if you, if you talk about countries like Nigeria, um, they'll say, okay, forget the internet. We don't have electricity, okay? So what we need is a printed textbook so that we can, you know, uh, study under candlelight. Um, we can, you know, go home and, you know, have our lantern and we can still study. Um, if, if you talk about mobile learning, yes, we do have mobile phones, some of us do have mobile phones, but uh, the battery runs out and we don't have power. So what do we do? So OERs, um, well, I mean, my, my title has OER in it, my uh, official title, so this is counterproductive. But, <laughs> but when it comes to um, the developing nations, we have to really, really think um, whether OERs, as they are today, are the solution for them, or do we have to rethink this whole philosophy and you know, try to see how OERs can be printed, different models, should it go in a newspaper, can there be um, advertisement in, uh, advertisements inside the textbooks, can that be subsidized in that way, different models, right? To, um, to mainstream OER in these countries. Otherwise, we will go on developing policies, we will go on um, you know, doing workshops, but you know, it will not be sustainable. A few universities might do it because it's the, it's the good thing to do or, or, the, or the good Samaritan thing to do, but um, it's not a sustainable movement. So I think I've come to my uh, last slide. Um, so, if you look at this declaration, it kind of captures it. Um, yes, we do understand the need. Yes, we do understand S the SDGs, but the governments have to really think uh, hard and long term uh, in terms of how do we improve infrastructure? How do we, how do we address the issues that we have, especially in the developing countries? Um, there, are more, there are far worse issues than opening up education over there. Um, you know, how to feed, feed the hunger, uh, or you know, how to give people electricity, or how to you know, give them telephones so that they can communicate, things like that. But having said that, uh, this is an important movement. We should keep pushing, and at some point, it will all fall into place. But the, the question is whether it will be too late, whether countries will be playing catch up. Um, when it comes to OER. 10 years down the line, there might be new technologies, new things coming out, and if countries are going into OERs and MOOCs at that point, uh, would it be worth it? So, thank you very much. I think I have 10 minutes or so for questions. Easy ones, please. Well, I mean, there are various aspects to it, right? You know, it, it's not just the content, it's the, the delivery as well. You know, how do you ensure the quality of the delivery? How do you ensure the quality of the student support? How do you ensure the quality of the interactions taking place? Um, so um, I don't think anyone has a definitive answer to that, uh, but people are trying to solve individual aspects of the issue, uh, but obviously it has to start with the content, 
Uh, but content now is not a problem because you know universities have their rigorous quality assurance processes which go through. Uh, but then we have to understand how the uh, student interaction takes place and the student support takes place. There's a lot of research going on, uh, but you know there are various aspects which need to come together. So um, the, the question is, when we figure out all of these aspects, will there be a new trend that we will be following? And uh, we will just you know dump the MOOC uh, concept altogether, or whether we want to learn from the MOOC concept and try to expand our uh, student reach and try to deliver to as many students as possible. So, you know, that would be my answer to your question. Yeah. Thank you. See, um, there's a slide, yeah. Um, although we are academics, um, we always want some sort of reward and recognition for our work, right? And I was reading something the other day, and it said whether you're an academic, whether you're a doctor, whether you're a pilot, whether you're a politician, or you know, whether you're whatever, you're doing a job, and you want to get paid for it. You're putting in um, some effort, um, your time, um, your uh, intellectual capacity, um, your physical skill into whatever you're doing, um, and you want to get a reward back. So um, ideally, when I even when I got into OER, you know, uh, okay, I did it because you know it was at the point at that point it was the thing to do, you know, because you could get your uh, materials out there. You can say you are in the OER movement, and you know, so you kind of build up your brand. That's that's uh, one way of looking at it if you're an academic. But um, realistically, some uh, universities have gone into including OER as a KPI. So when they do their uh, annual appraisals, um, they say, okay, how many OERs have you created? Or oh, how many courses have you developed using OERs? What's the percentage of OER you are using in your teaching? Um, are your students using OERs in their work? Are your students creating OERs? So you know that's, that kind of an indicator uh, is put in to their appraisals. So they get some sort of a benefit when it comes to their career. Okay. Uh, then there are other institutions who don't put it officially into the uh, KPI, but they give a kind of a, a letter of recognition. So at the end of each year, you know, you are presented this letter of recognition at, at this you know meeting, and say you know it says oh this uh, you, this is the best teacher for OER, and he or she has created uh, two modules on OER, things like that. So um, there are various models. It's up to the um, institution to uh, figure out how they want to go about it. But as I said, that's the last thing the institution worries about, right? When, it, when you say more money, they always go into shell. When you say take it for free, let's do that, <laughs> right? Give your stuff back, no way, right? So um, it's like the, the analogy, uh, uh, Wayne McIntosh, I, I, I'm sure you know Wayne McIntosh, uh, um, ORU wiki educator person. Wayne McIntosh says um, it's like the, the, the crown jewels of the institution, your, your course materials or your learning materials or you know, things like that. Um, however, the value of an uh, institution is the ability to give a uh, credit and a qualification. Um, the institution is not a bookstore. So uh, your materials are just supplementing the learning. The student can very well go onto the internet, Google it, and learn and come and write the exam, maybe better. So um, as long as institutions don't understand that concept, uh, it's very difficult to implement OER in, in institutions. So what they need to understand is their value is in the credit uh, or the qualification they issue, not in the course material they develop. You have a microphone too for questions, just so it's clear. Okay. Oh. Yeah.
find it or if you make something to make it discoverable. And I wonder if you have any thoughts about how we can kind of think about making resources that we create a little bit easier to find. Um, if, you to, if you look at um, resources and discoverability and um, the usefulness of a resource, you have to look at the openness, right? The five R's. Uh, you have to look at the accessibility, right? Uh, the ALMS, right? Um, and uh, uh, you have to look at relevance. How relevant is it to your needs? So um, when you look at uh, relevance, it's not just the uh, keyword match, um, although the keyword match is a, a uh, function of the uh, metadata which was put in uh, when the uh, resource was archived. Uh, it's basically how relevant is that material for your teaching and learning needs. So let's say, for example, I am teaching at the Open University of Sri Lanka, and I get this material from Harvard or MIT. Is it suitable for my students? Is the context suitable? Um, is it at the same level? Or should I get something from uh, the Open University of Nigeria, uh, which might be more suitable? So all of those aspects need to be taken into consideration when it comes to search. Um, if you talk about uh, the methodologies, you have basically federation um, and semantic search. So most of the time, we, we tend to use um, federation. Like, for example, I, I was doing some work in India uh, in non-formal education where these farmers, um, illiterate farmers, have created a large amount of content uh, in video format, okay? How to grow crops, um, how to use natural fertilizers, how to irrigate, you know, all of these things in, in Chennai, India. So they had around 2,000 videos uh, created by them. They had no formal training, although these materials had gone through a university and they were quality assured to a certain extent. And we were look, and there were these various communities of farmers putting all of these materials up on Facebook. So what I wanted to do was to create this farming federation and have one portal, because if you look at farmers who are teaching farmers, um, you have to make sure the, the technology is the easiest out there to use. The technology shouldn't be a barrier to get inside the content. So what we wanted to do was to create this portal, which is the simplest out there, and to federate all of these repositories uh, that these farming communities have, and to come up with one central repository for these farmers. So um, yeah, I mean, as I said, it's a, it's a tricky question. Um, it all depends on you know, where you put your material, how you market your material. Um, as I said, you need to build awareness about your materials. Um, but uh, if, you take, if you keep in mind the openness, uh, accessibility, and relevance, when you create your material and you, when you upload your material, then um, that should be uh, a bit more helpful. I think I'm out. Yeah. Okay, um, that's the uh, second question I ask whenever I go uh, do a training workshop. Um, I say, um, okay, if you have your teaching material and you teach a class, class of 30, um, how many people would have access to your material? 10 maybe, because not all the 30 will use your material, <laughs> right? <laughs> but, but, but if you take your material slap on a CC BY license on it, put it up um, on, I don't know, um, OER Commons or somewhere, um, and say, okay, the next time someone uses this, you have to give me credit, right? So the next time, the, the next 100 people who use it will refer to you as the creator. And these 100 people will not just come from your classroom, they will be global. So you have already rereached out to uh, a hundred global players. 
I think that will open up new doors for you or whoever uh, to move out to the market. It will give you more credibility as a person. Um, you will be more rigorous in your work. You would not copy, you would not plagiarize. Uh, whenever you um, attribute, you would attribute it properly. Whenever you mix, remix OERs, you will do it properly. You will apply the proper licenses, and you will put up a credible piece of work on the internet, which is a reflection of your ability. So that's what I will tell them. I will tell them that it will open up new opportunities in terms of consultancies, in terms of more exposure, in terms of uh, uh, chapter writing gigs, you know, whatever. Uh, but definitely making your content open will be more useful than keeping it closed and just distributing it amongst your students. That's the argument I use. Um, and I think, to me, it makes sense. Uh, but in practice, some people say, oh, you know, my, but, you know, my lecture notes were taken from this book, and, you know, I have that in my lecture notes, and I just distribute it to my class, which is kind of allowed within the university, but I don't want to put it online because I can't. So you have to change the way you think. You have to change the way you look for resources. You have to change the way you integrate resources. Um, and you have to change the way uh, how you uh, put out uh, those resources. So you know, that would be my uh, response to you. But um, then again, if you look at this one, uh, the organization has to buy in to the concept of OER uh, before anything can proceed. Otherwise, you know, you get these uh, cowboys who are doing OERs and, you know, uh, trying to promote themselves. I was one of them. Uh, try, <laughs> try, trying to promote themselves. And um, hopefully, you know, you get something out of it. Otherwise, you get the satisfaction out of it. Uh, but, um, you know, it has to be a systematic process. Um, countries, provinces, governments, institutions, staff, students, uh, it has to be a systematic process. Thank you.